I should have probably said that earlier because the chalkboard stuff can not be replicated, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, we're beginning the recording now. Oh, cool. So these are what you missed if you're watching the recording is um, I talked about this. <laughs> okay, so formal definitions. Fibonacci sequence is the defined by the recurrence. The current term is equal to the sum of the previous two terms, it, and the initial conditions are zero and one. Uh, the sequence has the following non-trivial closed form. I say non-trivial because, well, look at it. <laughs> this is not easy to work with. Um, you know, scores are rational numbers here and like exponents and, and like, oh, geez. Um, this is a closed form. But what you should really marvel at is that with all of these rational numbers floating around, you should marvel that this is an integer. <laughs> like for any n value, this is an integer. That's amazing. Does anyone recognize the value one plus root five over two? You can just yell it in the mic. It's no stranger to us. What, what are we looking at? It's cooler than pi. It's cooler golden than ratio. Yes, the golden ratio. Yeah, some might argue pi might be cooler, but um, I, 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 love, I love the golden ratio. And uh, it's denoted uh, letter phi. Uh, moreover, it's partner in crime, one minus root five over two is equal to one minus phi, which happens to equal the negative, the reciprocal of phi. So we can actually write this part here as negative, the reciprocal of phi. And if we do so, we have this beautiful form in the bottom of, of um, this beautiful form on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So uh, what about the Luca sequence? The Luca sequence is defined by the following rec recurrence, the same as Fibonacci, but with the L's. And it has also a non-trivial closed form, but it's slightly easier. It's the golden ratio and the golden ratio's buddy. Um, okay, so, ooh, Dr. Rook is back. So let's introduce you to congruence theory, although probably half the audience is probably well-versed already, but uh, it's clock math, essentially. So we all know 10 plus five equals 15, but what is the sum of 10 o'clock plus five o'clock? 10 o'clock plus five o'clock. Anyone take a gander. If I'm at it's three o'clock, three o'clock, yes, because maybe you're in the army and you think, well, that'd be 15 o'clock or 1500 hours, but that's essentially three o'clock. Um, because if we add five hours to 10 o'clock, we're at three o'clock. So uh, it's great. People should still know this analog clocks are kind of going out of style, but it's important to be able to, to keep this in mind so that you can understand congruence theory. Um, so in some sense, 15 is equivalent to three with respect to 12. Moreover, 27 is equivalent to three. Why is 27 also equivalent to three? 27 o'clock. This is like school. 27 o'clock, why is it equivalent to three? In 12 o'clock. 24, hour, 24 hours plus three. three yes. Yeah. Exactly, 24 hours plus three. Any multiple of 12 doesn't matter, right? You can subtract uh, multiples of 12. You can add multiples of 12. Those are, it's like adding zero. But if we subtract 24, yes, we, we're back to three o'clock. True, true, true. So negative 21 is equivalent to three with respect to the o'clock math. And if we add two multiples to 12 to it, to negative 21, we get three. So adding 24 hours to 20, negative 21, we get three. And why is 15 equivalent to negative 21, given that we have negative 21 is equivalent to three and 15 is equivalent to three? Why is necessarily 15 equivalent to negative 21? Yeah, uh, transitivity. Transitivity, yes. I'm not going to talk about this being an equivalence relation, being symmetric, reflexive, and transitive, because that's outside, but that's just tedious to do. But yes, if you're equivalent to the same thing, then you're equivalent to each other. Um, so let's define a, a symbol. We're going to say two integers a and b are congruent mod n, modulo n, <coughs> if n divides their difference. That is, if a minus b is a multiple of n for some multiple k, which is an integer symbol Z. And symbolically, we're going to write A congruent to B, where this triple equal sign is pronounced congruent to uh, modulo N. So in the previous slide, we saw that 15 is congruent to 3 mod 12. Negative 21 is congruent to 3 mod 12. And by transitivity, 15 is congruent to negative 21 mod 12. But can I? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. 
But if you if you take fifteen minus twenty one, it's six. Yeah, it's six. Neg it's yeah. negative six. Fifteen minus negative. Oh, what? negative. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Are we all good then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what is the Fibonacci sequence modulo ten? Well, it's a lot easier than anything mod twelve, because now we're thinking about. Um, actually, let's go back to the slide. Thinking about fifteen. If I divided twelve. 15 divided by 12 leaves, leaves a remainder of three. In some sense, negative 21 divided by 12 leaves a remainder of three. So you can also think about uh, remainders, which are the numbers. When I divide a number by 12, I'm going to get a remainder that's between 0 and 11. And, um, and so just think about that when we divide a number by 10. So first of all, let's recall the Fibonacci sequence. 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, et cetera, et cetera. If I divide these by 10 I just and collect their remainders, I'm establishing what I call the Fibonacci, the Fib, and Fibonacci number modulo 10. For instance, the number 13 modulo 10 is just the last digit, 3. That is the only thing that determines what the number is 10. So it's really easy to do modulo arithmetic. You just cut everything off but the last digit. And notice that uh, it follows the same recurrence. We have 2 plus 3 equals 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, 5 plus 8 equals 13, but in mod 10 land, 13 is 3, 8 plus 3 is 11, and in mod 10 land, 11 is 1, 3 plus 1 is 4, 1 plus 4 is 5, et cetera, et cetera. So we get the same Fibonacci uh, recurrence going, but mod 10, and it's a lot simpler. So here are the first 91 mod 10 numbers. Does anyone notice any or anything going on here? I'll give you like um, 12, oh, I'll give you 13 seconds. 13 is a Fibonacci number. 7077. 7077, you see, what, what about that? Well, Seven. I just saw it twice. Oh yes, there it is. It's got like a buddy. And okay. then it also is on the vertical line. It's going, it's 0774156171. It's repeating. Right. So when, when does it start to repeat? Fourth, uh, fifth row. Fifth row. All the way to, yeah. Boom, really. here, right? You're right. Fifth row, right there. That's the repeat. Um, that's where it repeats for sure. Um, so we, um, it repeats after 60 numbers. And this is Fibonacci curly F. I'm gonna call these things Sorry, I have to give it a name. These things curly F. Curly F zero is here, and curly F 59 is here. Then curly F 60 is here, and at the 60th one, it repeats again. And that's how it cycles. And it has that Fibonacci esque recurrence relation the nth term plus the n plus first term equals the n plus second term modulo 10. You're we muted hear. somehow. Yep, we can't hear you, Abba. Can't hear you. Now you're muted. Oh no, I know why. I keep, on, I keep on moving this little bar to see things, the little bar that's in the way. And so sometimes I guess I touch the mute <laughs> thing. Okay, you're good now. <laughs> okay, I really wish it could disappear, but maybe I'll, I'll write the Zoom company later about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the dog is bad because this is such a classic result, and uh, we should know that. Uh, this is thinking. So far back as 1774, Lagrange. Hey, Lagrange is on my wall back there. Okay, uh, Lagrange declared that the Fibonacci sequence modulo 10 is periodic and of length 60. But in 1960, a paper by D.D. Wall brought this into the modern world, proving that uh, for every m, the Fibonacci sequence modulo m is periodic. So all the research we're going to show you could extend to not just mod 10, but any mod, although we explore every other mod. But thus, that begins our little adventure, and let's start our adventure. Do they um, all do they all repeat after a length of 60? No, no. And this is that famous thing called the Pisano period. We do know that repeats it always even, except for um, and, uh, except for modulo three, because we have odd, odd, even, odd, odd, even. So it'll repeat, it'll be zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one. 
if we're doing mod, sorry, mod two, but then if M is strictly bigger than two, the period is even. And that's a well-known result. Mm -hmm. And um, we can get some odd periods um, if, well, we look at something that I haven't talked about yet that's in this talk, the second half of the talk. Okay. But that's a whole interesting world of studies uh, of, of, of Fibonacci studies, looking at Pisano periods. Okay. Okay, so joyful combinatorics in the subsequences. I like alliteration, you can tell. So let's take the 60 values and let's place them on a circle, because why not? Actually, this project was inspired by me. Um, I, I've dealt with astrology deeply, and this talk um, came from me listening to a lecture on YouTube by an astrologer who's quite famous, but he doesn't know a lot of math, but he started saying some things about Fibonacci sequence connected to astrology and some mysticism. And um, I just wanted to prove everything he said that wasn't related to mysticism. <laughs> and that's fun. Um, but me and him have uh, talked a lot. He's very excited to, that uh, my collaborators and I got hooked based on 20 minute video. <laughs> so here we go. We put it on the circle. If you want to think about Aries, Taurus, Gemini, if you like, it doesn't matter. Uh, at the top o'clock, we have 12 o'clock, we have the zero, that's the start, and then we go around. And then the 59th one is right here, where we would be 11 o'clock, that the last one, then we're at 60. Then we go to 61, 62, 63, and then we're repeating. So, um, so oh gosh, this thing at the bottom is now in the way again. So let's move to top, um, no, top right. Okay, so given an I do curly F sub I equals curly F sub I mod 60, meaning like if I want to know the 61st, uh, when I is 61st, 61, that's the same as when I is one. But if I want to know what happens when I'm at a 75, F sub 10 comma 75, which is this zero, that's the same as F 15, because I just have to subtract 60 from 75. So we get the full sequence. So we get the se a full sequence that looks like the following from zero to infinity, but it repeats every 60. Um, so now we're gonna look at subsequences and what this, I call this the Muller sequence, the Muller modulo sequence. So subsequences of the following form. So let's explain what the K and R are because the J is a dummy subscript. So K and R are the only interesting thing happening here. So these are subsequences of the Muller sequence where we're going to alter values like k. k is the starting value, because clearly when j is 0, the rj disappears, and we're just looking at the starting value. Where on the circle are we starting? Um, then the value r is the jump size. Like We're skipping 1. When j is 1, we're skipping r. When j is 2, we're skipping twice r. When j is 3, we're doing 3 times r. So it's an, we're looking at equal size jumps around the circle. So for example, when k is 1 and r is 15, I have curly F1, then I jump 15 units to curly F16, jump 15 units to curly F31, curly 46, et cetera. And I get at those points in the circle, I have 1793, 1793, 1793. And so let's look at this. We call this a square aspect in astrology because if we trace it on the circle, it forms a square. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we go from one, this is uh, curly F1, then I go to curly F16. And then um, this is, by the way, it's all in ticks, T-I-K-Z. Great, crazy what you can do with LaTeX. Um, jump to nine, jump to three. And then if I go another 15 steps, I'm back to curly F sub one, but this is really curly F sub 61 at this point. And so I form a square, but that's what happens if I start at one. What if I start at two? Well, I get that. I get the same sequence of numbers, one, seven, nine, three. What if I start at three? Well, I get the evens now. No odds, two, four, eight, six, in that order. If I start at four, I get, I get one, seven, nine, three, one, seven, nine, three, but I get a cyclic shift of it. We get three, one, seven, nine, three, one, seven, nine, which is basically one, seven, nine, three, but just did a little, um, it's not even a permutation. It's the same exact order. And that's interesting. So what we're actually seeing, I feel, is like, Stuff that you wouldn't see in the Fibonacci sequence, just looking at it on its own when you're jumping 15. So looking at sequences mod 10 in the Fibonacci sequence tells you things about the actual sequence itself. Oh, oh, I skipped one. If we start at k equal five, then we get sequence five. So 
This table establishes everything that we need to know for any value. Why is that? Because if we go from starting values from zero to 14, let's go back to this picture. If I had a value zero to 14 as a starting value, then I know what happens in any other point. Say I want to know what happens if I started at the 20th K value. Well, that's the same as a shift of starting at the fifth K value. So really this table encompasses all the information in the rows of anything that can happen. So these are all of the sequences that we can look at in this order. And sorry, in some order at some starting point, maybe another starting point would be seven, nine, three, one, but essentially it's cycles. So we have the following properties. Four, four, four types of cycles appear. Cycles contain only odd or only even values. These are the four cycles that we see up to some ordering of the starting point, but they must be in the order, like 2486, 2486. It could be 4862, 8624, but never 4286. It can never, it can never break the order that it's in. Um, and there's a direct connection between those cycles and the following sequences. Powers of zero, powers of five, powers of seven, and powers of two, mod 10. This is, uh, yeah, exactly. I love that someone said, hmm. <laughs> that is the reaction that, leave your mics on if you got some more hmms, because this is a hmm. And why is this occurring? Well, we had too much to study, so we're just giving this away. You search this out. This is this is great, and uh, it's uh, it's gotta. There's gotta be some great uh, simple number theoretic reason at the heart that why the Fibonacci sequence mod ten wants to be related to powers of uh, especially the seven and the two. Kind of really intrigued me. The five and the zero are kind of no brainers. Um, but okay, so moving on. So this is a free research project. Take it with you. All right, give it to your students or do it yourself. So what we cared about is quasi Fibonacci sequences. We made this up. What does this mean? In the subsequence, if we go from a J term and add it to the next jump, J plus first term, it's the same as J plus second term. So for instance, in the, the zeros, uh, what we're seeing is like here, zero plus zero is zero and zero plus zero is zero, but that's not happening at this level. One seven is not nine. And having at this level, two plus four is not eight. So it's not happening there, but it is happening in the in that land. Um, so, so we're caring about those sequences. So which R values is it quasi Fibonacci for all starting values? Well, definitely not R15, because we saw that. But for those R values not appearing as the answers, what K values of any is it quasi Fibonacci? Well, when R is 15, it works for K equaling zero, we saw or K equaling 15, because that's the same starting point. So let's look at one where it does happen. Jump size of 25. Let's start at the third position. K, K is three, R is 25. We jump 25 units clockwise, we get to the number one. Another 25 units, we get to three. Another 25 units, get to four. So two, one, three, four. Two plus one is three. One plus three is four. Three plus four. What do we think the next number is? Probably seven, right? Let's jump 25 units clockwise. Boom, we hit a seven. So we're actually getting this image um, that uh, this is the 11th move. At the 12th move, back to F3. So when the jump size, which is 25 here, shares a factor with 60, we're going to get some kind of shape like this. If, if, if the jump size, like was say 15, 15 divides 60. So we got a square, we got a convex polygon. That will happen with any jump size that divides 60. But if it merely has a factor with 60, but doesn't divide it, such as 25, then we're going to get something that looks like this dodecagram. So we're going to get something where the lines cross and it looks pretty. So, um, so we, had, we drew so many pretty pictures and this is uh, there's only so many we can show you. <laughs> <laughs> but this is great. Two, one, three, four, one, eight, nine. This sequence this seems so special. You're going to want to put it in your pocket and marry it or something. Just like, yay. Um, so, <laughs> well, this is a really pretty sequence. I just think it's really pretty. Okay. So, in this case, observation one, uh, each K in the subsequence follows by one of these five rows. Why do we say one of these five rows? Because if I want to know what happens if I start at the number eight here, that's the same as starting at the number one up to some shift, you know, like here, if I wanted to know if I started at position uh, F curly F sub eight, well, that's like starting at position curly F sub three, but then just starting at this point. 
So that's what we're saying. These five rows encompass all the data. And we can see we get zero plus five is five. Five plus five is 10, which is zero. Five plus zero is five. So this first row is quasi Fibonacci. The next row is one plus three is four. Three plus four is seven. That's quasi Fibonacci. The bottom middle one, one plus eight is nine. They're all quasi Fibonacci. So every K value, no matter what you start at, is the point we get the J term plus the J plus first is the J plus second. And that happens for all of them. Hence, we conclude that um, this is a quasi Fibonacci sequence, no matter what K value. So 25 is special. 25 is special. Um, and again, I'm loving this two, one, three, four. That's why I highlighted in red. Isn't it just so pretty? Okay. Does anyone notice? It? Oh, there's that sequence again. Why is why is Abba obsessing him with the two, one, three, four, one, eight, nine? Hmm. Two, one, three, four. Hmm. Was it on? Did we talk about that on the chalkboard? Am I in the way? Is it? I don't know if you can even see this on the chalkboard because it's not because it's probably just a little camera, but Luca, Luca, and I'm so happy you didn't say Lucas. Okay, I, I got uh, admonished once for saying Lucas, and uh, it's like saying um, I like that artist Dagus. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry he's about great, that. and that Monet guy is pretty good. Claude Monet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Luca sequence is, uh, is this is the Luca sequence mod 10. So it's kind of just lurking in the R equals 25 thing. So Luca is very special, indeed a very special sequence. It's, it's not kidding around. Um, okay, so there's his name, Edouard Luca. And um, so results on the quasi, so what did me and Dan and Miko, uh, what's our big deals? So when R is congruent to one mod four, oh, and I didn't change the slide, Dan, you didn't write it down. Sorry, you did. <laughs> three and three does not divide R. This is a typo, my bad. And this typo has been here for so long. Okay. So if R is congruent to one and three does not divide R, for example, the number 25, 25 divided by four leaves a remainder of one. So 25 is such an R and three does not divide R. Sorry, sorry, again, permute the three in the R. We do get that the j term plus the j plus first equals the j plus second. So we have proven why 25 is special. And also, if r is congruent to 3 mod 4 and 3 does not divide r, we get a reverse thing. We get the j plus second plus the j plus first equals the j term. So we get it in reverse, going clock, counterclockwise around the circle. Um, so that's kind of cool. That's really cool. At least both of these results are very cool. But still, we want more. We want more because we, we were just searching for more, most beautiful, not just very beautiful. So how are we going to define beauty? Subsequences of the original mother sequence, which themselves coincide with the parent sequence. Wow. Okay, this is not a big huh. But remember, this sequence here on the right is 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. So we're talking about a, a, a sequence that's exactly zero, one, one, but it's a subsequence. We're gonna talk about jumping around the circle. Well, let me just show the damn, show, sorry, show the slide. <laughs> okay, say we started at the 30th position and we jump clockwise 49 units. So I'm starting down here at six o'clock and I go around 30, 49 units. 49 units clockwise is the same as negative 11 units counterclockwise. So going 11 backwards, right? So I start here at zero and I go 11 units this way, I hit a one. 11 units, I hit a one, 11 units, I hit a two, 11 units, I hit a three. And now let's go further. And then I'm cycling more, five, three, eight, nine. This is unbelievable. We got the mother sequence back in exactly that order by jumping around the circle. It's as if the circle is hiding the circle inside the circle. <laughs> but it's just, um, and this happens, uh, well, this happens in many different ways. 49 is not special. There's seven other numbers where we go clockwise, we're gonna get this. And there's another eight numbers where we go reverse, we'll get the zero, one, one, by doing various jumps of 40, jumps of giant size 40 or 47 or 17 or 49 or any number like that's relatively primed to 60. Those jump sizes are special. 49 is the only one that's actually not prime of all those special numbers. So this is actually the most special of the special numbers. Um, okay, so our very joyful uh, results is if we have u60, define this to be the units in the integers modulo 60, or we can just say 
numbers that are relatively prime to 60 and smaller than 60, positive numbers. Um, and r equals 60, then the following, if r is congruent to one, the subsequence coincides with the original sequence starting at some point in the original sequence. Maybe not exactly at zero, one, one, but maybe at like, two, three, five, at the two point, some starting point that we will determine um, based on uh, what this K value and what that R value is. And then if it's R congruent to R mod three, R is congruent to three mod four, then it will do the thing backwards around the circle by going clockwise with jump sizes. You can also find that N sub KR. And the N sub KR is the magic carrot predicting its precise value um, well, that doesn't really elude us. If we can prove the conjecture one on the next slide, then the mystery is solved. And I'm going to show you what conjecture one is and also tell you why it's not a conjecture. Um, so if we're talking about R and U60, meaning numbers, positive numbers smaller than 60 that are relatively prime to 60, like the number 49 or 43 or 47 or 17, those numbers, the following holds. If R is congruent to 1 mod 4, F sub 10 R is exactly R mod 10. If R is congruent to 3 mod 4, F sub 10 R is exactly equal to minus R mod 10. And why do I say this is a proven? Well, we there's only 16 numbers in U60. Let's try them all. Uh, 49 is one of those numbers. It's congruent to 1. And if we go to the 49th point in the circle, it indeed is the last digit of 49. If we go to the 47th point in the circle, which is congruent to 3, note that uh, this should be negative 47. If I add a bunch of hands to that, I get positive three. And indeed, that's what the 47 point in the circle is. It is positive three. And so this is proven by exhaustion. So I mean, not very exhaustive. 16 checks is not exhaustive. But this is too beautiful to just have a proof by like confirmation. This should be proven by something deeper because it looks so beautiful and so simple that there must be something deeper going on. And um, maybe take a picture of the screen, memorize it, write it down, uh, prove it by the end of the evening and please send me a proof because it, it's, I mean, we've proven it, but I'm the type of mathematician that can feel, a, um, I don't know why it's true. And I don't think that's enough to know that it's true if you don't know why it's true. You, know, you all know what I mean. Like knowing that something is true is not good enough if you don't know why it's true. And you can know that things are true knowing why, and that's just gotta be frustrating. It's not frustrating then you're approved by exhaustioner. <laughs> okay, okay. So enough soapboxing on like my opinions on what proofs are good. So mod 10, that's what we did. What should you do? Other mods. Um, faculty at Providence, do that. Or emeritus, anyone, just uh, pick it up. Provost Klein, if you're still, you do this. <laughs> that's the provost of my university. I believe she's in the room. Um, okay, so Wolf is ending the first half of the talk. Uh, oh, wait, am I the same Dr. Hey, is this the same Dr. Wolf? No. Oh, I think the Zoom got hijacked then. Okay, well, I got to check the loop um, feed. The, uh, that's okay. It doesn't matter. How do you pronounce Lucas, everybody? Anybody? Uh, Luca. Luca. Okay, good. All right. So, project one done. Miko, she's a Leo. Abba, I'm a Sagittarius. Dan, he's a Taurus. And we're saying goodbye to this project. And let's see. The real Dr. Wolf has a question. Yeah, what's my time, Kayla? I hope I have time. No. So we usually go until five. It's 4.51 now. <laughs> Maybe okay. uh, an overview. Um, what did I do wrong? The other one is so oh, cool. <laughs> what? <laughs> Should I just try to do a little bit more for five minutes to give you a ring of feel? Whatever you'd like to do, yeah. I would like to get, like do the whole and, talk. And of but... course, um, you know, whoever needs to sign off at five is welcome to sign off at five, but I won't close the window <laughs> mid talk. So that's fine too. So if, 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 if some people are good, can I just go and then they email me questions or should I really stop and be courteous? What does, I, I really would love to talk about the second thing. I think if you'd you... really love to talk about it, you can talk about it. And uh, Corey, I'll just say to the audience, if anybody wants to sign off or needs to sign off, uh, you know, go ahead and do so. Um, and I can always uh, send an email um, with to the recording. people who, who, who attended. Yeah, what was that, you're, you're recording it, so yes. we have a link to the recording. Yes, I, I can oh, share yes. that with Yes, the only major drawback is people with questions currently. 
I guess. Um, I can share your email information as well. In case okay, okay. Because that. really the next project is uh, is equally beautiful. Like, but I think I can do it in like 12 minutes. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I think, but it's, it's, it's really miraculously beautiful. And it's got some good open questions. Someone's going to get a research project by the last slide out of this, at your college. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, you know, Dan. He's not old enough to drink, but he's sitting underneath the free beer sign. So this is before COVID. Uh, and this is recent. We were both vaccinated, of course, and this is our improving conjectures. And our paper is now an archive. And I'm going to put it in the chat um, so that people can actually get it. Is that easy to do? Can I just put a paper in the chat? Yep. And I, I can share stuff, too, um, later okay. on. Um, um, how do I put a paper in the chat? Is there an attached thing? Oh, well, you can oh, share well, a I can link send it page. in the chat, too. Oh, you send it. You send the archive version to the chat, right? Yeah, I'll put it in there. Okay, appreciate that. Okay, so that saves me time. Cool. All right. So Dan and I's paper is in the chat. It's going to be submitted to Fibonacci Quarterly by the uh, next next week. So in the first issue, that's what the word inaugural means. Uh, Dan suggested that I I define that word <laughs> to students his age who maybe don't know what that word is. <laughs> Uh, issue of Fibonacci Quarterly in 1963, I.D. Ruggles proposed the following problem. Show that the sum of 20 consecutive Fibonacci numbers is divisible by the 10th Fibonacci number, 55. So let's just show a picture. These are the first 20. Um, the sum is of the red stuff is 17,710, and indeed that's 55 times something. That's another starting point. Let's start at the number three. Add those numbers up, we get 75,020. Indeed, that's 55 times something. Let's start at the number eight. We add those 20 consecutive numbers. We get 1,096,405. That's 55 times something. It seems believable. So of course, Dan and I um, had to prove that and then some, especially and then some. <laughs> so we're looking at sequences of consecutive Fibonacci numbers using summation notation here. So this is the first 20. This is the next 20. This is the next 20. This is the next 20. And we considered something more than what divides them. We, we said, what's the greatest number that divides them? Who cares about 55? Is there even a greater number that divides all of these numbers? So we're looking at the GCD of this infinite sequence of numbers below. And um, we discovered that 55 not only indeed does divide them, like Ruggles suggested in his problem in the Fibonacci quarterly, but it's also the greatest number. And we proved that there is no number greater. Um, but that's just the, the small tip of the small tip of the iceberg. Well, what's special about 55 and what's his connection to the sum of 20? So 55 here is the 10th Fibonacci number. And then Dr. Wolf here, who's really smart, believes that 10 is half of 20. And, and they, that's Dr. Wolf's chosen pronoun, uh, so Dr. Wolf told me, they assert, uh, they assert the following, that the GCD of this infinite sequence of sums of 20 consecutive Fibonacci numbers is indeed F sub 20 divided by 2. In other words, F sub 10. That is what um, they assert and what me and Dan also do believe I mean, because we've proven it. <laughs> okay, so what Dan and I proved in light of the latter, there's nothing special about 20. This holds for every K value that's congruent to 0, 4, 8, mod 12. Former 12 o'clock math. 20 is congruent to 8 o'clock, mod 12. So it is indeed one of these k values. 20 is one of these k values. So what we proved in particular is that if k is one of these three types of moduli classes, mod 12, the GCD of the sum of k consecutive Fibonacci numbers equals Fibonacci number f sub k over 2. So this answers Ruggles question in, from 1963. And it also answers an infinite class of questions that can be asked. Like, what's the sum of? Um, uh, says 64, um, sorry, not 64. Yeah, six, 64 is consecutive numbers. Uh, well, that would be F sub 64 over two. Why? Because 64 is four mod 12. So we've answered an infinite class of, 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 of GCD questions, which is kind of interesting. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. The full iceberg is so much cooler than that cool result. So we're going to establish some quick notation so that you can advance your research in this area, I hope. Uh, generalized Fibonacci sequence, we use a G here. It's uh, the nth term is the sum of the previous two terms. And we just have some general conditions here, G0 and G1 are any integers. So in general, that's how the definition. Um, OK, so Fibonacci sequence is recovered when 
the initial conditions are zero and one respectively, as we know from the chalkboard behind me and what we did in the beginning. And the loop sequence is recovered when G naught is two and G one is one. So we can speak in general of generalized Fibonacci sequences and it includes these two. So for brevity, we're gonna use Gibonacci sequence instead of saying generalized Fibonacci sequence, just the word Gibonacci. That was coined by Jennifer Quinn and Art Benjamin in their proofs that really count book. Okay, so curly F denotes this value. I'm gonna call that curly F, curly F of K. Curly L sub K would be the GCD of consecutive K, K consecutive sums of K consecutive Luca numbers. And curly G will be the GCD of sequence of K consecutive Gibonacci numbers. We'll call this curly F, curly L, and curly G. Fun fact, Dan and I call this fib sum, loop sum, and jib sum in our macro commands in our LaTeX. Um, so let's see. That's not really a fun fact. That's just a fact. There's something fun about that. <laughs> OK, um, Okay. these are our main results. So the, the Ruggles problem is this one little square. When k is equal to 20, in other words, can grow into 8 mod 12, um, the, the, sum, the number f sub 20 over 2, in other words, number 55, divides any sum of k consecutive Fibonacci numbers. How about the sum of 20 Luca numbers? Well, the greatest common divisor, according to Dan and I, results, and it is true because we have proven it, is 5 times f sub 20 over 2. In other words, 55 times 5 is the greatest common divisor of any sum of 20 consecutive uh, Luca numbers. For in general, if I have any old G naught and G1, by the way, this results have to be for G naught and G1 being relatively prime. If they're not relatively prime, then the GCD is a multiple of this one. So we really have classed them all, but we care only when G naught and G1 are relatively prime. So if that's the case, then we're gonna get either this case or that case dependent on what G naught and G1 is. What G naught and G1 will, will determine these two values here. You're either, this value is either equal to one or not equal to one. If it's equal to one, then the, G, the curly G value is F sub K over two. If it's not equal to one, this, this little GCD, then the curly G is five times F sub K over two. What's really interesting is this column row because all of these things are the same no matter what um, starting value. So it doesn't, so really we can block out these two and just say, it doesn't matter what G naught and G1 are. As long as they're relatively prime, we're gonna get uh, L sub K over two. So any number that's 10, um, that's 10, six or two mod 12 will give these values when I add up those many numbers. So say for instance, I wanna look at the sum of 10 consecutive uh, Fibonacci or Luca or Gibonacci numbers it's the, the greatest common divisor is going to be L sub 10 over 2. So by these theorem numbers are coming from the paper that Dan has posted in the chat or will post in the chat in the archive paper. So for K odd, we have these classes. And the only thing different here is we should say that we, we've got only a sufficient condition here, not a necessary condition. But we do know the numbers that we can get. We can get numbers that are not 2, not 1. But what we know is that we're never going to get numbers where, that are divisible by a prime that's um, three more than a multiple of ten or three less than a multiple of ten. That's a little technical point. It's in the paper, but there's this has this is where the, the Pisano periods come up really heavy in in the, the analysis. And it's a little deeper part of our, our work. Okay, so Dr. Wolf, how did Dan and I approve the following slides? Those theorems. There's only two things we use, and we're almost at the end. Um, Theorem is amazing. It's got so much potential outside of our usage of what we're doing with it. Um, and, and the world just needs to see this. But the, the largest integer that divides every sum of K consecutive Gibonacci numbers is the following GCD. Remember, K is a fixed number. So we can just throw some numbers in there. So I can I can figure out the GCD of the sum, the GCD of K of a sequence of sums of K consecutive Gibonacci numbers just by looking at the K value and plugging in these specific numbers. Um, and the second one is it, the largest integer that divides every sum of k consecutive Gibonacci numbers is the, get ready for it, least common multiple of all the moduli values m such that the generalized Bazano period with the symbol of m divides k. That is the following. Okay, this is a little deep, 
too much for this paper for this this I didn't I didn't include the details in the talk. This is in the paper. A full talk can be done on just these two formulas because they're 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 beautiful and they have some implications and new ways of looking at the Fibonacci and Luca numbers in general. And I can't wait till the Fibonacci quarterly gets this so that people can exploit these two formulas. But I'm going to give you an application of the top one so we can see how do I use it because right now it just looks like a bunch of G's. Right. All right. So Ruggles problem. Let's recall the sum of 20 consecutive Fibonacci numbers is divisible by F sub 20 over two, said the dog wolf, you know? So 55, let's prove that another way. Curly G formula on the previous slide is the following. In the Fibonacci setting, the Gs become Fs. So we have this. Let's plug in a K of 20. Plug in a K of 20. We get the GCD of F21 minus F1, comma F22 minus F2. That gives us two numbers, 10, 9, 4, 5, and 17, 7, 10. And we know, voila, we have 55. It's a quick way and a harmless way to get that GCD. So let's apply this. So, so that's kind of, that's nice. We, we see that the, that Abba and Dan's awesome formula can be applied to something, but now let's apply it to something that we didn't think to apply it to that just came out afterwards and showed its face in, in amazing awesomeness. So first we call our, our, all of our main results. What do we notice about the second row? The beauty is that they're all L K over twos. All of them, no matter what the starting values are, G not G one that are relatively prime. So remember that L K over twos for any K that's two, six or 10. Now let's examine K values of this form. We'll do a tiny bit of number theory. Oh, also remember this, uh, this is not horrendously ugly, but it's horrendously difficult to compute with because it's it's, it's difficult to just pop, um, to, to compute with it. <laughs> so we've got an easier formula. So if K is congruent to two, six or 10 mod 12, then for sure K is an even number. And also K is two more than multiple four. So basically K is congruent to two mod four. So if we divide an even number of the form that's two more than the multiple of four, if I divide it by two, I'm left with an odd number. That is the nature of these types of even numbers. There's two types of even numbers in the world. Ones that are multiples of four and ones that are two more than a multiple of four. And the ones that are two more than a multiple of four um, don't have a lot of evenness. They're not as even <laughs> as the ones that are zero on four. They're less even, so to speak, because uh, you divide them by two and they're suddenly odd. So that's what's neat about the, the, the class two mod four. They're barely even, um, if such a thought, such a term exists. So our theorem, our great theorem is if J is an odd positive integer, and suppose we have a Gibonacci sequence, any Gibonacci sequence with relatively prime condition, initial conditions, we can compute the value L sub J without using this crazy thing. And it's going to be given by our simple formula, curly G, uh, apply it to two times J. And so this simple little value is the following. So we can compare the top, this Binet formula to this simplicity. If I want to compute L sub 17, I just come up with any two starting values, not even the Fibonacci sequence, any two numbers like seven and four or anything, it doesn't matter and then look at what G sub twice 17 plus one is and what G sub two twice 17 plus two is, and that would give me L sub 17. And that, that's stunning, that's miraculous. And we're thinking about submitting just this problem to the Fibonacci quarterly and just saying, why is this true? No matter what values we start with, why can't we compute L sub J when J is odd using that? Because unless they wrote our paper, they're gonna have a different, um, a different approach to this problem. This is indeed a super novel way to compute uh, a Luca number, a closed form that doesn't look like this. The beauty is it doesn't matter what G naught and G one is. This is like any Gibonacci sequence. That's amazing. I now. I hope at least 10 of you are crying. Is there any even 10 of you still here? Okay. <laughs> okay. But that's like, I'm marveling. It's still, if you know closed forms for recurrences, this is on par with the most beautiful, I mean, I can't, are we allowed to toot our own horn? But I mean, just, I, it's just, it's so simple. And this is not, I mean, this is Binet. Binet is wonderful, beautiful. This is amazing. This is historical. Um, and this is, I don't know, rock and roll. This is new, right? 
this is classical music up here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see what's up here. New problem. This is the last thing. A wicked, an open question. Let's instead of sums of consecutive Fibonacci numbers, what about we take squares of consecutive Fibonacci numbers, square each of them and add them up? Well, we did a little bit of research and we've got some data that suggests that the answer is extremely simple. Remember what I wrote on the board that F sub n times L sub n is twice F sub um, is F sub 2n? Well, looking at some data, if we looked at the sum, say, of 20 consecutive um, squares, like of Fibonacci numbers, add, add up the squares of Fibonacci numbers. Conjectural data gives us that this is the that every sum is divisible by F10 times L10, but F10 times L10 is exactly L20. So we conjecture that the sum of 20 squares is equal to F20. The sum of 14 squares is divisible by uh, F14. I mean, that's too simple a thing. And if this is true, a sum in a providence should prove this because me and Dan have enough on our plate. Um, <laughs> And this is just so beautiful, and I, I just would love to see a solution um, by the end of uh, the week, I guess. Wait, 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 maybe two weeks or something. Homer, and that's it. I think we got a dog. This is Mackenzie West's dog. It's called Dog Dr. Pepper. Uh, I made this slide f f like 10 minutes before the talk <laughs> started. Right. And so nap time. It's time to go to bed, and I appreciate your time. Um, this is the list that we used and thank you very much thank you <clears throat> yes the applause is really uh it's all short in <laughs> but thank you and we have we can go ahead and ask uh, some questions so frank i see your hand is raised first of all thank you very much i'm almost <laughs> <speaking yesterday>. <laughs> <laughs> we are stopping the in society over um I just want to say Koshi was a very active member of our MAA section. Uh, oh. We really, uh, he hasn't been active for a while, but he was always at the meetings and was a, a very- this is, this is why he hasn't been active. This is new. <laughs> yeah. no, he, is, uh, he was very important. Uh, uh -huh. Second, um, sometimes when you use mod in the computer uh, field, it doesn't work well for negative numbers. I don't know why, but I think there are some uh, implementations of it that just don't get it right. Uh, it, it's kind of weird, but uh, you have to be very careful when you use it. At least I think so from what I've seen. Yeah, well, we haven't been using, doing a lot of modular arithmetic on the, we've been mostly churning out hard data um, to get conjectures. Um, Mm -hmm. I like your background, by the way, uh, Frank. It, it, it's, I feel like there's some um, golden rectangles behind you. There's the, it's the Trevi. <laughs> I feel like I'm sitting in the cafeteria watching, like sitting on the curb watching everybody go by. <laughs> Do we have other questions for our speaker? Yes, Christine. Sure. Uh, so thank you for uh, a very interesting talk. Uh, I think we met uh, briefly in uh, Denver after you had given your invited address there. Oh, and, uh, so, oh yes, I do remember that. Yes. Uh, I, I ran into you in an elevator or something. I mean, you know, uh, but uh, so it was nice to be able to hear the, the whole thing and, and uh, kind of linearly and, and all. Um, I, I have a couple questions, but I'll start by just asking one, which is, um, no, there's something very appealing about this and you've presented it in a very uh, sort of uh, theoretical, let's be motivated by how beautiful this is. But mm -hmm. there are things like, you know, the Fibonacci search technique. Do you imagine any uh, connection of, you know, between uh, some of the results that you're getting and some of the more mathematical and i.e. not astrological uh, applications of the Fibonacci sequence. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure what the Fibonacci search thing you're talking about. I, I'm, a, I'm a new Fibonacci enthusiast as of like maybe three years young in the field. So, uh, and, and seeing that there's like, that this is just the starting point. I've, um, and my collaborators have some ways to go. 
<laughs> no, I, I mean, long before you were born, I, I got interested in, in, in the Fibonacci search, which is, I mean, it's, it's kind of a modification. If you're looking for an optimum, one thing to do is you keep uh, bisecting, you know, you, uh, and, and you sort of look for the, the, the highest element in each of, of, of two sets, and then you cut one in half. And the Fibonacci uh, search technique sort of mimics that, but instead of bisecting it, you, you chop it in a ma manner that's related to the Fibonacci sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was just kind of wondering if, you know, if either Luca, you know, or maybe there's a Luca search technique for all I know. <laughs> there seem to be, every time I encounter something that's Fibonacci, there seems to be a Luca analog, if not a Gibonacci analog. Okay. Because I think people are, are, are cont continually researching this stuff and, Gibonacci is as far as they can always extend it. They're like, why stop at the famous sequences when we can generalize it to an infinite class of sequences upon which like uh, apply it to some small aspect and you get these well-known results from Fibonacci, you know? Okay. Uh, okay. And actually that's, I think that's my, our motivation was, I think Dan has pushed us into Gibonacci more. I think I was really focused on the, the concrete and then he's kept on saying, well, why not expand to have them all? And that's just like a great idea, you know? Okay. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. it is. It is. So, mm -hmm. do you have any reflections on, you know, I'm getting, this is to sort of step back from not only the details, but, but, but even maybe the mathematics. Do you have any reflections on the hold that the Fibonacci sequence has on the human imagination? Uh, you know, you, you alluded to the fact that people find it, you know, in pineapples and in, uh, you know, and in the Parthenon uh, and, uh, you know, and here, there and everywhere and obviously in astrology, which was one that I hadn't known. So I thank you for that. But do you have any sense or what, why, what is so, why, did, why this? Why is this so compelling? Why are so many people drawn? To Accessibility is the first thing I can say. Um, honestly, the what you needed to understand this talk was calculus one maturity, not even calculus one. But this accessibility of this, this is hardcore research, but anyone can start it. Um, okay. You do not need linear algebra, although there's a lot of matrices things you can do, but you, do, you don't need, um, you need some maturity, but not, is it for enthusiasts? I, think, I really think the word enthusiast keeps on going. There's amateur mathematicians, but Fibonacci enthusiasts are people with ISDs who are really developing papers. Um, you can see it from the early Fibonacci quarterlies. Uh, there's nuns and priests and all these people just oh, like there's an opera papers. Singer. <laughs> and there's um, an opera singer. Jerome Hines published a paper in the Fibonacci quarter. <laughs> um, uh, Jerome Hines. Jerome Hines, who was a uh, uh, again, this was long before you were born. He was a uh, uh, a very sick. He was a very successful bass on the Metropolitan Opera stage from the mid '40s to the mid 1980s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he also had a lifelong interest in mathematics. And mm -hmm. though Fibonacci stuff was not the center of his interests, uh, he sort of strayed into that. And he did publish one paper in the Fibonacci Quarterly. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, accessibility, that seems to be the, the key. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. All right, good, thanks. Yeah. And maybe my research student can answer that. Dan, why did you get like interested in what I was interested in. Because <laughs> you seem like oddly obsessed. <laughs> I mean, I just personally, I, I like the Fibonacci sequence because it really provides the foundation for the Fibonacci sequence. Because what you can do is you can multiply uh, Fibonacci numbers by your initial values of your Fibonacci sequence to get any Fibonacci sequence you'd want. It's a famous identity. But also what's really cool is everything is just so surprising. Um, like we found in the sums and the Fibonacci sums, we were able to compute some, a bunch of data and get these really astounding formulas. And I think that was uh, motivating to try to prove these nice conjectural results. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks. Hmm. I was kind of going off that. Um, so yeah, as you yeah, you were mentioning how yeah these yeah, and thank you for the talk. Yeah, it's like super interesting, all these like cool patterns that you discover. And yeah, as you were saying, Dan, like yeah, some of the patterns are um, like pretty surprising. That yeah, you, these numbers that kind of first yeah, it kind of it looks like a kind of like a mess to sort through, and then yeah, you extract these like really kind of cool patterns from it. 
I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about kind of like that, maybe like the research process of it. Like, is it a lot of trial and error where you just are like playing around with a bunch of different things and then like you eventually find something that looks like a cool pattern or like, how do you find kind of like the conjecture that you want to, um, to prove in this, yeah, in this type of area? I mean, yeah, I think it's really fun in that sense in that, yeah, you do get a mess of stuff to sort through, but it's really fun. I mean, for me to, an to analyze like tables of Mathematica data uh, to say, okay, uh, we have we can compute these GCDs to what we think it's going to be. Okay, now let's look at this line. What what patterns do we see in there? Okay, well we get a two on everything that's a multiple of uh, uh, everything that's three or nine mod twelve. Okay, we get this. What what do these comments? What do these numbers have in common that are spaced out every four? Or uh, and then uh, once we get that, we're like, okay, we have this guess for what this should be let's try to think of any reasons why this should be any and I think that those are two fun parts about research is to taking the table uh sorting through it trying to find these patterns trying to answer why and moreover in that as you're diverging into that quest of finding out why we had to come up with some new identity or is and it was fun to try to kind of tinker around and see if, see how you could manipulate this certain value to be a product of these two other things. And so again, some more trial and error with Mathematica, but eventually you get it, you tweak it around enough and it seems to work conjecturally and then you try to prove it. Let me add something to that too. Like in the beginning of our infancy of our research with Nico and Dan, um, I brought down sheets of paper that were, you know, about the size of my torso and then long rulers, big circles. And I was like, this is art class, but there seemed to be something about these jump sizes. We have to draw everything possible because none of us know how to make a computer do this. <laughs> so we started drawing out the patterns and seeing what numbers they were. And, and that was the discovery. And that was actually a lot of fun to do. It felt like real math because we were, we were working with like rudimentary tools, not like waiting for a computer to, to, generate some data and like spit up some numbers. Um, it just felt tangible. Um, and also what we drew became little pieces of artwork that is now lost. But um, <laughs> yes. The last, the last year that I taught, I tinkered around with a two by two matrix to calculate Fibonacci, which is one one on the top row and one zero on the bottom. So it's n plus one and in the upper left and the or the upper right and the lower left and the n minus one term in the bottom right. And if you do that n times, you keep you get the next number and, and then multiply it by itself. But there's a well-established method in computer science that if you do, you're calculating something, I'll call it x to the n. If you calculate n to the divided by two, you got to adjust it a little bit if n's an odd number and then multiply it by itself, then the time it takes grows with the log base two instead of n. So I did that. I didn't have enough time to get it into class. Right after I retired on my computer, I calculated the, at least the one millionth Fibonacci number. The real challenge though is displaying it because you have to convert the binary number to decimal. And there was a, somebody in the UK wrote a, a really good long integer system in C++ and I used that and I didn't change it, but I adapted it for the length of integer I was using. And so to print the number, essentially you do modulo for about half the number in, in mod 10, that saws it in half, so to speak. And then I did it twice more and you end up pouring, since you're gonna display it left to right, but calculate it right to left, you end up pouring them into stacks and then printing them out. And I don't know how many screens it took, but it was kind of fun. And it's alarming when it's log base two, how fast the calculation is. Thank you. Uh, I like to say uh, uh, what Chris was talking about. It almost shows how mathematical the world is. It seems like everywhere we look, we bump into mathematics. Uh, I guess that's 
what just the fact I like mathematics, but it still seems it's everywhere. Everything we look at, we pop into new things. Uh, it's so exciting in a sense. Any other questions for Abba or comments? Yes, Christine. I'll just make one one closing uh, uh, thank you to uh, to Abba. Uh, I wanted to to thank him for uh, explicitly making a point that I have have sometimes made in uh, thinking about how to teach students to write proofs. That is, I really I really appreciated the fact that you felt your conjecture was still a conjecture when you had proved it by exhaustion and hadn't seen why it works. Because I think it's uh, when we're teaching students to write proofs, we it pays to think about why do mathematicians do proofs? And one of the reasons that we do proofs is that uh, sometimes a proof helps you understand why something is true. And it's really that understanding why that's more important to you, maybe even maybe even more important than the very fact that you are proving that it shows a deeper connection between ideas. So I wanted to thank Abba for, uh, for, for making that point so eloquently. By the way, uh, we are hardly exhausted by that proof by exhaustion. Yes, <laughs> <But> <laughs> Any more 16 isn't so bad. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Abba, for your talk. I really enjoyed it. And thank you, everybody who attended. Um, and uh, just this is our last colloquium of the semester. I thought it was a great way to end. Um, some really beautiful ideas to be thinking about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anytime. I'll come back. <laughs> Sounds good. Maybe one one time in person. Maybe we <laughs> in person. Oh, and that dinner. <laughs> I, and I, I owe you a dinner. I'm sure we'll run into each other. So I owe you a dinner. Oh, yes. Always lovely to run into you. You have left out the fact that we have a paper together. You you said Wait, that we see each other. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yes. Yes. <laughs> so as an outsider, I just want to say thank you. I totally enjoyed it. Yay, Ali. Very nice to meet and, you. And so you're going to look into Wall Street, how Wall Streeters traders. I, oh, yeah, I lived and grew up in Manhattan. I have no interest in Wall Street, but I'm going to look in the Nachi connection now. <laughs> yes, you can maybe, um, mathematic, a millionaire <laughs> mathematician. How's that? Um, <laughs> I, I live in a castle now. I'm good. A oh, very small yeah. castle. Very good. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Oh, I, OK. So are we signing off, Kayla? Um, yeah, I, if you stay on for just a second, I'll talk to you. And um, yes, yeah, so everybody's welcome to go. I will send out an email with the link. So if anybody wants the, the recording, they'll be able to view it that way. Mm -hmm. I should have said record in the beginning. My bad. I know. For, and you know, sometimes I do, and I, I didn't think of it. I usually ask before I start recording just because mm -hmm. everybody's now on camera and being recorded. So I didn't happen to. to it's OK. It was four trivial identities and one very great quote. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm glad that we got the bulk of it. Actually, I can go ahead and stop the recording mm -hmm. now.